I'm the ICU director at San Gregorio Memorial Hospital, so I'm in charge of the intensive care services. I've been with Beaver Medical Group as the pulmonologist, critical care specialist, and sleep specialist since 2007. I'm an assistant professor at Loma Linda University, and I'm also an assistant professor over at UCR School of Medicine. So insomnia increases with age, and in older adults especially, if you look at what they report, both initiating and maintaining sleep, 43% of them have a problem with that. What are the common factors associated with insomnia? There's a lot. I mean, medical illnesses. If you have to get up to pee six times a night, even though you don't have sleep apnea, and even though you don't have insomnia, you're gonna have a problem with sleep. Psychiatric illness, this is the biggest one, I think, depression. If you're depressed, you're not gonna sleep, and you're not gonna be able to sleep until you fix the depression. That's, that's number one. But all the medicines that people are on, have you seen the medicine lists that some of your colleagues are on? I mean, Sometimes you need a pill for the side effects of the other pill that you're on, right? I mean, it's ridiculous, it's ridiculous. And alcohol will, will is not, is very, very efficient at putting you to sleep, but the problem is, is that alcohol is so short acting that you go through a little mini alcohol withdrawal three hours later and you're up, okay? So that's the problem with alcohol. There's other problems with alcohol too. Caffeine, guess what caffeine does? Caffeine affects your adenosine levels. Can you see why that might make you a little bit harder to go to sleep? Okay, especially if you have caffeine in the evening. Nicotine can do that, blood pressure medications, decongestants, psychiatric medications, antihistamines, antidepressants during the day. All of these things can affect your ability to go to sleep. Circadian rhythm disturbances, going to bed too early, getting up too early. So if your circadian rhythm is shifted early, and you don't realize that, then you're gonna have hypersomnia from eight o'clock till 10 o'clock at night, which is when your spouse goes to bed and which, which is when you wanna to go to bed, or which is when you think you need to go to bed, and you're gonna be very sleepy at night. And then your circadian rhythm's like, okay, we're done at four o'clock in the morning, and you can't sleep till you get up at seven, which is when you think you need to get up, right? And then add on to that that you're awake, lying in bed, from four o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock in the morning, and you're saying, I can't get sleep. This isn't good. And you become frustrated. And then you associate all of those feelings and thoughts with your bedroom, right? Then you walk into your bedroom when you wanna to go to sleep. And all of those thoughts and feelings come back to you, and it's performance anxiety. And that causes more insomnia and it feeds the fire, and it's a perpetuating behavior. Do you see how that works? So there's ways to get rid of that. Um, and then there's these primary sleep disorders. Okay, they also think about this. You guys are the perfect ones to talk about. When you guys were young, you didn't have televisions, did you? You didn't have iPads, did you? When it got dark, it was actually dark, wasn't it? So can you imagine what, what light does? I can tell you what light does to melatonin production. Light hitting the eye chops off melatonin production. And that actually causes your circadian rhythm to be shifted later. So imagine now you take an entire population of the United States, you give them electricity, you give them lights, you give them television, you give them iPads, you give them computers, and they're all using it until 11 o'clock at night, and they're exposing their eyes to bright light, what is that gonna to do to their circadian rhythm? It's gonna it, it's going to delay it, correct? They're gonna be going to bed later. Has there been any change in the time that people go to work? No, in fact, more people go to work and have to travel long distances to go to work and are stuck in traffic. So what do they have to do to get to work on time? They have to get up? What's happened to the amount of time in the United States that we have to sleep? shrunk, dramatically shrunk. And what do you think that's doing to people's nerves and their well-being and their quality of life? What do you think that's doing to them? Yeah, exactly. That's the problem that we have in this, in this country. And we have to work, work, work. So we can pay for the electricity that's keeping us awake. <laughs> so if I were to take people with insomnia, they can't sleep, and I were to figure out after I eliminated their medical problems, 
what percent is related to their sleep? This is what we would get. 35% would be due to psychiatric illness. This is why I say this is so imperative. If you have a sleep problem, specifically insomnia, and you have a psychiatric diagnosis, most commonly depression, it is imperative that you get the depression fixed because the insomnia will not get better unless that is fixed. So we need to screen for that as, as physicians. 15% is psychophysiological or performance anxiety. This is what I was alluding to. Um, imagine having to go on to Carnegie Hall's stage and go to bed and sleep in front of 3,000 people. You couldn't do it, right? It's impossible to go to sleep if you have performance anxiety. Now, for some people, going to bed at night is like going out on stage in Carnegie Hall because they're afraid that they're not going to be able to get the sleep that they desperately need to be healthy. And this is what they've done in their life. They've made a mountain out of a molehill and have caused anxiety. And, and this is, happens. They, they're in the kitchen or they're in the family room or they're in some other room in the house and they become tired and they feel that they're ready to go to bed. And as soon as they walk into the bedroom where they've associated all of those feelings, what, they, they can't go to sleep. You've heard of Pavlov's dogs, right? Remember the experiment that Pavlov did with the bells? And this is exactly the same thing. So this, it's this psychophysiological performance anxiety. Drugs and alcohol dependency, restless leg syndrome, circadian rhythm disorders, and this paradoxical sleep disorder. These are very uncommon. We hook these people up to electrodes and we see, and they're actually sleeping just fine. They just don't think they are. Obviously, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. This is not the first diagnosis that I would come up with in somebody. So we've talked a little bit about insomnia. We can divide up the philosophy of this into the three Ps. There are predisposing factors, which are biological, genetic, you know, people who like to worry. You can't change that. That's just hardwired into their body. There are precipitating factors. Similarly, this is also something that we really can't change. If something happens to you, there's nothing you can do to avoid it, right? A death in the family, a divorce, a birth. These are precipitating factors that cause you to not be able to sleep. And these things happen, right? And then there are perpetuating factors. This is something that you can do, and unfortunately we do in a way, and it causes us not to be able to sleep. This is behavioral. We're going to break that down. So this is how it looks. Here is the line above which you can't sleep. If you can go below this line, then you can sleep. So here you are in your pre-morbid condition, you're going along just fine, having great sleep, taking it for granted. And then something happens to you, a precipitating factor, that's the blue. Death in the family, divorce, marriage, baby being born, whatever it is. And now you can't sleep, okay? So you're above this threshold. Now, as the effect of that initial problem wears off, you can see it starting to come down, it will get to the point eventually where it no longer will cause you not to be able to sleep. You'll go back to sleeping just fine. Unless you institute a perpetuating factor to keep you above that line. So the question is, is what are those perpetuating factors? How do, I, how do we identify those? And what can we do to get rid of them? And I think if we can do that, we can get you sleeping again. Does that make sense? OK. So that's how people feel like. And let me talk a little bit about what those perpetuating factors are. We've, we've kind of gotten a little bit onto that already. What are some of the perpetuating factors? Well, put yourself in the mind of somebody right here. Okay, after a couple of nights of not being able to sleep, what are you gonna say? I need to sleep tonight. I'm going to go to bed earlier. Worst thing you could possibly do. Because is your circadian rhythm is saying that you need to go to bed at 10 o'clock and you go to bed at 8 o'clock, what do you think is going to happen between 8 and 10 o'clock? You're going to lay awake. And if you're laying awake and not being able to go to sleep, what's that going to do to your anxiety? It's going to go up. And you're going to associate that with the room that you're in, right? So now what you're doing is you're reinforcing this pattern, okay? So you need to de-escalate. You need to say, this is, this is fine. I'm going through a thing. This is not... This is not as bad as it is. I'm going to be fine. OK. What's the other thing that you could do? You could say, I need to get to sleep. I am going to watch television in bed. I'm going to read in bed. I'm going to work in bed. I'm going to pull my laptop out. Okay. Now, if you're doing that and you're sleeping fine, 
continue to do that. I have nothing against doing all that activity. The people that I am talking to are the ones that are not sleeping well. Just as though you could walk into the bedroom and have this feelings of anxiety, what I want to do is do the opposite. I want you to walk into the bedroom and subconsciously think in your mind, it's time for me to go to bed. Okay? So if you walk into the bedroom, your brain has to say to you, oh, you're walking into the bedroom, it's time to go to sleep. But what happens if you're watching television in bed and eating in bed and reading in bed and doing all those things? Now your brain is saying, oh, you're walking into the bedroom. It's now time to go to sleep or watch TV or read a book or, or, okay? So I'm only allowing you one other thing that you can do in the bedroom, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you can do that one other thing. That might help with sleep too, who knows? <laughs> But uh, you have two options in terms of what kind of a bedroom you want to walk into, okay? You can walk into the bedroom that you watch television in and you read a book in and you do all these things in, or you can walk into the bedroom where you've got a 50-50 chance of sleeping. And if you get the other, that's not bad either, right? Okay, all right. So these are some of the sleep hygiene things that I'm talking about, is get rid of those things. If you have a television in your bedroom, get rid of it. Now, if you are having a problem with sleeping at night and you find yourself laying awake in bed and you can't sleep, what should you do? That's right. Get up, get out of bed, go to a different part of the house. Associate your insomnia with a different room, a room where you don't need to be sleeping. Keep that bedroom as the place where you actually successfully go to sleep. Um, make sure you have a daily routine. Make sure that you are getting up at the same time. You're going to bed at the same time. That's going to keep your circadian rhythm on track. Okay? So it knows. It's not being confused. Try to have a way of winding down at night. A winding down routine. Soft music, aromatherapy, all sorts of things. Don't exercise at night. Exercise in the morning. Exercising in the morning is very good in terms of reducing stress. Don't watch the news, okay? Especially if you're politically inclined, don't watch some political show at night and say, oh, that fill in the blank, okay? You don't wanna be thinking about that sort of stuff, okay? Don't pay bills at night. Or if you have something that's on your mind, write it down on a pad next to your bed and say, I'm gonna deal with that in the morning. I don't have to think about it right now, okay? So these are things that you can do to avoid these things. Yes? What's your thoughts on taking melatonin to help you sleep? Yeah, melatonin's great. Melatonin is, uh, however, the problem with melatonin is, is that not melatonin itself, it's how you buy it. It's not an FDA regulated uh, drug, because it's not a drug, it's actually a, a natural substance. Your body makes it. So anything you buy over the counter, you don't know how much is actually really melatonin. The effect of melatonin is going to be the opposite of light at night. Light exposure to the eye is going to delay the onset of your circadian rhythm. Melatonin is going to do the opposite. It's going to advance it. So if you take it about half an hour before you want to go to sleep, it's going to help in, in terms of having you go to sleep. The irony is, is that the smaller the dosage, the more effective it is, up to a point. So two, three milligrams, no more than five milligrams. If you take more than that, it's not going to have that effect and it's just going to make you really irritated. Not because you can't sleep, but it actually just physically makes you irritable. Yeah, people take it on a daily basis. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a natural substance. Um, but just be, be aware that it's going to advance your circadian rhythm. So you want to take it at the same time every night and you want to take a relatively low dose.